recording. Amen. So again, so we are in the family Bibliography and Spiracy. And one of the most um, important characteristics of the family Bibliography is that this particular Biblio is a comma-shaped okay, curve bacillus with a single flagellum. So we all know for a fact that if the organism is in a single flagellum, they possess the so-called monotrichus flagella, meaning to say um, they are they are a curve-shaped organisms. And for this particular bacteria, um, there are two important species, and these are the Vibrio cholerae and the Vibrio parahemolyticus. These species are actually common in human diseases. So there are, in fact, 11 species involved in human infections, and most of them are found in water. So they could either be found, they could actually be found in fresh water and salt water. So when we say brackish water, it's actually a mixture of fresh water and seawater. So usually we can find them in the junction where the river, the fresh water meets with the seawater. So the water there is brackish water and and they have a different um, salt concentration. Okay, not usually as low as the fresh water, but not as high as the salt water. So that particular salt concentration would affect the growth of halophilic organisms. Again, so when you say halophilic organisms, we are referring to organisms that would require high salt concentration. Um, Vibrio is usually involved in epidemics, so it's a cyclical and the positive agent is actually uh, Vibrio cholerae is the positive agent of cholera. So if you will be asking me um, to describe the stool of a person with cholera, um, it is described to be as rice watery. So it's water, um, alam niyo parang am ng sinaing. So it's watery with flecks of mucus. And it is kind of fatal because of the extreme loss of water and electrolytes. So the reason why it is fatal is because of the electrolytes imbalance, particularly when you lose a lot of potassium. So this, this will affect um, your heartbeat. So imagine having a diary of 10 to 30 movements per day. So it will really result into dehydration and hypovolemic shock, loss of fluids and volume can cause that rapidly fluids are not restored. So um, to, to address um, this extreme dehydration, of course, um, it is very important that we have a fluid replacement therapy. And this particular fluid replacement therapy is actually filled with electrolytes. And the reason diarrhea is happening is because of the toxin being produced by the microorganisms. Okay, so I told you that there are 11 species of this comma shape or curved bacillus with a single polar flagellum. The two most common are Vibrio cholerae and Vibrio hemolyticus. However, aside from them, we also have Vibrio fluvialis. Damsella, Holosei, Mimicus, Bulnificus, and Alginolyticus. So these are the other important species of Vibrio. So as you can see here, so this particular table came from me. Um, Vibrio cholerae would have several serotypes. No? There are actually um, several serotypes which I will be discussing later on. But the most common, particularly here in our country, is the Vibrio cholerae 01. So, if you're wondering what O means, O refers to somatic antigen. Okay, O refers to somatic antigen. And when you say somatic antigen, it came from the cell wall. And why did they assign the letter O here? Um, probably because um, the letter O refers to the O polysaccharide carbohydrate content found in most gram-negative bacteria. So the O-polysaccharide, so that's the biochemical structure found in the gram-negative cell wall. So that's how they assign the serotype. So O1, the one that you can see here, 
okay, O1, O1, 3, 9, 9, O1, this all refers to the so-called serotypes. And serotypes are important because this will determine the antigenic property of the bacteria. Although Vibrio cholerae O1, Vibrio cholerae 0139 are the same species, but they differ in terms of serotypes. And this is important, especially for investigating the epidemiological pattern of cholera. So for China, for example, what is the most common serotype? For Japan, what is the most common serotype? For the Philippines, what's the most common serotype? Just like when you are studying COVID-19, right? There are variants, but for cholera, there are also other variants, or we don't call it variants for bacteria, but we call them serotypes. And, and in order for us to determine the serotypes, we usually do um, uh, typing them with anti-sera. So we call them serotyping. So when we type this bacteria with anti-sera, we call them serotyping. Okay, so the most common serotype, serotype as what I've told you, is Vibrio cholerae O1. Um, this would cause cholera, gastroenteritis, wound infections, and bacteremia. And then another relatively common are O139. It will cause cholera. And then non O1 will cause gastroenteritis, septicemia, and ear infections. Vibrio parahemolyticus can cause gastroenteritis and wound infection. And then Vibrio bulnificus can cause septicemia and wound infection. Vibrio alginolyticus will cause wound infection, ear infection, conjunctivitis, respiratory infections, and bacteremia. And Vibrio mimicus okay, will cause gastroenteritis and ear, ear infection. And Vibrio damsella will cause wound infection. And then Vibrio fluvialis uh, will cause gastroenteritis. Okay, so these are the different species of Biblio. Okay. As, in terms of habitat, the human intestinal tract is the normal reservoir, which means that the when you say reservoir, we are referring to the source of infection. And Vibrio cholera is actually the causative agent of Asiatic cholera. Because it's really common in freshwater pools and estuaries in Asia, in the Middle East. But this can also be found in Europe, uh, at the coastal areas of South, Central, and North America. So they inhabit uh, the Vibrio parahemolyticus, on the other hand, is found as a free-living organism um, that would require salt for growth. So relatively compared to Vibrio cholerae, um, Vibrio hemolyticus is more halophilic. So they are more halophilic because they would require salt for growth. So they inhabit estuaries also and coastal areas all throughout the world. So these are the usual habitat of the two most common species of Vibrio. Therefore, the risk factors for getting Vibrio would include travel to coastal or cholera endemic areas we're in that particular area is not practicing hygiene. So there is inadequate sanitation, particularly in developing countries. So Philippines is in red flag as far as risk factor is concerned. And then eating of undercooked or raw seafood, particularly for oysters, because we don't usually cook oysters. We just add water for oysters. Okay, so... Chances of you get, getting Vibrio parahemolyticus is actually um, very high. And then increased use of recre recreational water facilities uh, will also lead to increased exposure. So kapag pala nag, ano kayo, nag wakeboarding, di ba? Nakita niyo naman yung wakeboarding, yung water doon, hindi naman siya malinis. Tapos... Uh, ilulublub ka doon at uh, yon so when you open your mouth so some of water uh, will actually uh, get inside you so that's a risk factor as well so Vibrio cholerae is a small comma shape with monotrichous flagella so they are aerobic and they prefer an alkaline pH so between 
8.0 to 9.2. That's the pH needed for the growth of Bibri Colliery. So they can ferment glucose, sucrose, and mannitol. So take note of the sugar. Not just glucose, they can also ferment sucrose and mannitol. So let us review what do you mean by fermentation. Okay, so when you say fermentation, we are referring to anaerobic breakdown. So we are referring to anaerobic breakdown of complex carbohydrates. So usually polysaccharides is being broken down to monosaccharides okay, because of certain enzymes. And as a result of that particular breakdown, okay, the pH becomes acidic. Okay, so the pH becomes acidic. So if the pH becomes acidic, so that's actually an indicator that break the the complex carbohydrates such as polysaccharides has already been broken down. Okay, into much simpler form. So glucose, sucrose, and mannitol, these are examples of monosaccharides. So not all um, Vibrio can ferment sucrose, for example. So that's somehow will help us identify them in the laboratory. So Vibrio cholerae is positive for cholera red test. Um, they're also positive for the nitrate reduction because of the nitrate reduction, reductase. So this enzyme can convert nitrate to nitrite. And oxidase test, you're already familiar with this one. Um, if we're familiar with the Neisseria, we discussed this during Neisseria. So oxidase test is one of the screening tests that we're using for Vibrio cholerae. So this is the mac microscopic appearance of Vibrio. You would notice that they are indeed comma-shaped. Okay, and this is the gram stain. So they are gram-negative bacilli. And the other illustration that you have here is the acridine orange stain. This is a fluorescent dye. And we are using this for fluorescent microscopy. Okay, so another a closer view of the gram stain of the Vibrio species. So if we're talking about the genome of Vibrio, there are actually two circular chromosomes, about 4 million DNA base pairs. And because of this, there are about uh, 3885 predictive genes. Okay. Now, not all Vibrio are able to produce toxins. So they will only be producing toxins if they got the genes that would enable them to produce toxins. And usually, these toxins or these genes are being delivered to Vibrio cholerae by using a uh, lysogenic bacteriophage. So again, if you remember Corinebacterium, this is how Corinebacterium got the, the toxin. So a bacteriophage, which is a virus, will inject the genes onto the Vibrio cholerae. And the virulence factor is found in VPI, which stands for the Vibrio pathogenicity island. So it's actually a cluster of genes that contain um, genes that would increase the virulence of Vibrio cholerae. So we call it the Vibrio pathogenicity island. So this is the bacteriophage CTX lambda. So this particular bacteriophage is a filamentous fudge that contains the genes exotoxin. So infectious CTX particles are produced when Vibrio cholerae infects humans. So in addition to CTXA and CTXB genes encoding cholera toxins, CTX lambda contains eight genes involved in phage reproduction. So packaging, secretion, integration. So the CTX lambda genome is about 6.9 kilobase pair long. So once the Vibrio cholerae is infected with this particular bacteriophage, then that Vibrio cholerae becomes more virulent because of the CTXA and the CTXB genes that will encode for the cholera toxin. And I told you before that the reason why people with cholera got diarrhea is because of the cholera toxin. Okay, so the Vibrio pathogenicity island. 
contain genes involved in the creation of TCP. So TCP refers to the toxins co-regulated co -regulated pilus. So the VPI is actually a cluster of genes. So if, if you found it, so if, for example, this is the Vibrio, so there is a particular cluster of genes here called VPI. Okay, TCP. So TCP stands for toxin co-regulated pilus. Okay. However, um, once infected with bacteriophage, there would now be um, additional um, cluster, ACF cluster, which has four genes. Okay, so what are these genes? The ACF, ABC, and the tag E. So you can have ACFA, I'm sorry, you can have ACFA, ACFB, ACFC, and tag E. So these are the four cluster of genes encoding a putative accessory colonization factor activated by the ToxR. Okay, aside from that, there's another cluster called TCP cluster, and they have 15 genes. TCP A, B until letter T. And the last one, which is the tox T. So it is indeed an island. So when you say island, it's not the usual island in the sea that you're looking at. But when you say island, we're looking at cluster of genes. And these genes will enable the bacteria we were coloring to produce toxins. Okay. And once toxins are produced, you now have the exotoxins, okay? So exotoxins will result in prolonged hypersecretion of water and electrolytes. So there would be dehydration and death. So it does not invade tissues but remain adherent in the gut. So this is, for example, the, the microscopic view of our colon. So you can see here simple columnar epithelium. They will not invade the columnar epithelium here, but they will adhere. Okay, so this is the these are the bacteria. No, they will just adhere, and once they adhere, there would be hypersecretion of water and electrolytes. So there would be failure of water reabsorption, and water would be secreted in an extreme fashion. So therefore. They describe ischiatic cholera to be a violent diarrhea. So violent diarrhea that can result to collapse and death of a person. So um, it has about two to five days incubation period. So there would be intense loose bowel movement, exhaustion, and rapid dehydration. So you would know that there is a rapid dehydration because if you will be looking at the face of a person, the face is shrunken. And the skin is wrinkled. Diba when you swam in the pool for the for the entire day and then you, when you got out of the pool, when you get out of the pool, you would notice that your skin is wrinkled. So that's how they describe the skin of a person with cholera. So as what I've mentioned, um, the stool is rice watery, the temperature and blood pressure falls, and then the person will be in comatose. So the enterotoxin is actually a cholerogen causes hypersecretion of water and chloride. So signs and symptoms of cholera would include profuse painless diarrhea and vomiting of clear fluid. The incubation period is about one to five days and you lose about 10 to 20 liters of diarrhea per day if untreated. So that's why they call it as a blue death and dehydration and, electroly and electrolyte imbalance will actually proceed. So rapid pulse and low blood pressure will all result to death if not addressed immediately. So this is a person, as you can see, um, the shrunken face and the wrinkled skin. So take note also the rice watery stool that you have here. So the eyes are sunken, this decreased skin torture with which produces wrinkled hands. Okay, so bacteria will colonize the small intestine and release the toxin. So the diarrhea is caused by the cholera toxin called cholerogen. So cholerogen is a toxin that has a subunit and five multiple binding unit. Okay, so the A subunit 
and five multiple binding B-sub units. So you have the A and B. The B-sub unit binds to the GM1 ganglioside receptor. Okay. Now, the A2 subunits allow sub A1 subunit to enter. So once A1 has entered, the A1 subunit will stimulate the adenylate cyclase by inactivating G protein. So they now interfere with the signal pathways okay, inside our body, which in turn activate the C-AMP. So once C-AMP is activated, this will lead to hypersecretion and electrolyte loss. Okay, so that's that's how it works, no? So cholera 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 toxin. So as you can see, um, you have the A subunit and the B subunit, and then the B has other multiple B subunits. So the A two will push A one to enter, and once A one has entered, this the A one will activate the C amp, and once C amp is activated, this will result in two hypersecretion of water and electrolytes. So that's the action of the cholera toxin. Okay, so another example of a shrunken face of a person with cholera. So as a medical technology, it's very important for us that we know how to culture Vibrio. Blood agar plate works well since it contains enough salt for most Vibrio. For Maconki, um, lack, they are lactose negative except for bulnificus. But if clinical history may indicate Vibrio, perhaps one of the best culture medium, one of the highly selective culture medium that we're using here is the TCBS. TCBS AG agar stands for thiosulfate citrate bile salt sucrose. Okay? Thiosulfate citrate bile salt sucrose. So take note of the term sucrose. Okay, so sucrose is the sugar content and this will somehow help us differentiate other species of Vibrio because not all species of Vibrio can ferment glucose, uh, sucrose. Now, take note that in TCBS, we're using here bromthymol blue as indicator, pH indicator. Okay, so bromthymol blue, if it turns acidic, it becomes yellow. If it's alkaline, um, the colonies remains blue-green. Yellow colonies means that Vibrio was able to ferment sucrose. So fermentation has taken place. If it's alkaline, it means that no fermentation has taken place. So in this case, Vibrio cholerae, Vibrio alginolyticus has yellow colonies, meaning to say they are sucrose fermenters. Vibrio parahemolyticus and most Vibrio bulnificus um, becomes green, meaning to say they are non-sucrose fermenters. So if we're dealing with, so of course when it terms to, when it comes to commonality. Vibrio agenolyticus is not as common as Vibrio cholerae. So Vibrio cholerae is more common. So if you're in the lab and you're able to see small pinpoint yellow colonies, so you can actually point your identification towards to Vibrio cholerae. Okay, so this is how Vibrio cholerae look like in sheep's blood agar. So, and then the other one is the PCBS. In PCBS, you would notice that um, they have small yellow colonies. Vibrio parahemolyticus does not require sodium chloride for growth and can tolerate 8% sodium chloride. So, as you can see here, Vibrio parahemolyticus is this one. The green colonies, meaning to say no sucrose fermentation has taken place. For Vibrio cholerae, you would notice here the yellow colonies. Ibig sabihin, this is positive for sucrose fermentation. Okay, so that is for the Vibrio parahemolyticus. Okay, so another example of Vibrio cholerae on TCBS. So you notice that uh, there are yellow colonies. 
So other culture media that we can possibly use for vibrocolory are alkaline telluride medium, wherein you'll have a pinpoint black and glistening colonies. And then the Dudon's medium will give you grayish dewdrop-like colonies. And alkaline peptone water, um, this is the enrichment broth that we are using for vibrocolory. I say enrichment broth because um, this particular um, medium, liquid medium or liquid broth, has an alkaline pH that will inhibit the growth of other enteric organisms. Gelatin agar will give you pinpoint smoky bluish gray colonies. And other culture media are tellurite taurocolate gelatin agar. Okay. So once you have seen beaver colonies, excuse me. So once you have seen Vibro colonies, um, you can actually um, confirm if they're indeed Vibro by using several tests. So one of the tests that you would probably use <clears throat> is the Vibro stat disc, so which separate them from Eromonas because um, because Eromonas uh, will be resistant to the Vibro stat disc. And then the string test, um, all you need to do is to emulsify colonies. So you have here a slide, and then you have here colonies, and then you add uh, two to three drop a drop of sodium desoxychalate here, and then you get a string using a loop. Uh, you get an inoculating loop, and if you are able to get a string, so if this is the loop. This is the colony, and, and if there's a string, when you immerse the loop on top of the sodium desoxychalate and colonies mixture, then that's positive for string test. Generally, it's not a great test, but somehow it does help us in suspected cases. So again, majority are halophilic. The cholera red test um, is the nitrosoindol reaction. Uh, it's being done in alkaline peptone water with tryptophan, nitrite, and sulfuric acid. Obviously, the positive result in cholera, cholera red test is red. And then the bacteriolysis is the Pfeiffer's phenomenon, and we're using this um, in guinea pig. So you need to use a live animal. So this is the 0129 susceptibility test. Uh, the active component is a 2,3-di-amino-6,7-disoporyl-teridine monophosphate. So if there's a zone of inhibition, it means that it, the organism is actually susceptible. And most of the Bibro species are susceptible in 0, 1, 2, 9. It's not 0, but it's really O. O, 1, 2, 9 susceptibility test because O refers to the somatic antigen. Okay, so let's talk about the O. O represents the somatic structure or the O antigen found in the cell wall. And we can differentiate the species within each genus or should I say serotype within the species. Commercial antibodies produced in animals, sheep are actually used to speciate the organisms when isolated from human infections. So most important species are Vibrio cholerae, Vibro parahemolyticus, each antigen, but they are not useful since each antigen is not useful because all Vibro would have the same flagella. So, as what you can see here, no, um, O1 is the serotype that would cause majority of outbreaks. O139 is confined to Southeast Asia. So the somatic O antigens are used to differentiate species within the genus. So O antigen is, as what I've told you, the reason why we call it O, because it came from the O polysaccharide cell wall of 
gram-negative bacteria. Okay? So, viral cholerae has six zero groups. So, O1 would be the most common okay? and it's the most important. So, that's the reason why we classify the serotypes whether they are O1 or non-O1. So, non-O1 uh, will result to a mildly generally not produce cholera vaccine. Okay? And O1, aside from having serotypes or subtypes, they also have new groups. So, we have O1 can be further classified as classic or LTOR. And then O1 may even have subtypes such as Ogawa, which is the A and B, Inaba, A and C, and Hikojima, A, B, and C. Okay, so do not do not get confused. Huh? O1, uh, if, L, if you are looking at classic and LTOR, we are, this is an example of biotypes. Then O1, if you're looking at Ogawa, Inaba, Hikojima, um, this refers to the subtypes. But if you're looking at Vibrio cholerae and classify this one as O1 and an O1, then this refers to the serotypes or the zero groups. Okay? So do not confuse with this particular classification. So Inaba is common in Japan. Hikojima is common in India. And Ogawa is the one that is common in Philippines and in China. Okay, so these are the two biotypes of O1. So we have the LTOR and classical. So cholera has been global pandemic in Asia, Africa, and Latin America for the for decades. So with cholera infection ranges from asymptomatic colonization to life-threatening vomiting, copious water stools flecked with mucus and epithelial cells. Hence, they actually call it the rice watery stools. So infection with other Vibrio uh, ranges from gastroenteritis and it even causes skin infection and soft tissue infection. So and I think I have already discussed this one. Different strains. So aside from the LTOR, we also have the Celebes and the Vibrio fetus. Okay, so how do we differentiate the true Vibrio from the LTOR? So there are actually there are actually um, biochemical tests that will differentiate them and other tests as well. So for example, hemolysis. The two Vibrio is negative for hemolysis, but the LTOR strain um, will cause beta hemolysis. And then Greg test is positive for LTOR strain. Vodsproskauer, so VP here stands for Vodsproskauer. This is positive for true Vibrio, but negative for the LTOR strain. And then susceptibility to the 50 unit of beta polymyxin or B polymyxin. Um, to Vibrio is acceptable, meaning to say there is a zone of inhibition here, but it is somewhat resistant to the LTOR strain. And then for the can hemagglutination test, this one is negative for the Vibrio, but positive for the LTOR strain. Okay, so how do we collect now stool sample and analyze them for Vibrio? Okay, so first, we collect the stool sample. So you'd notice that there is a right watery stool. Now, if the laboratory is in a distant location and you are in the community, for example, you need to place it in a transport medium. Okay, so there's a transport medium, okay, for, for Vibrio cholerae. And from there, you can actually do two things, you know? First, you can inoculate them in alkaline peptone water. So what's the purpose of inoculation in alkaline peptone water? This serves as the enrichment broth. This, is, this has a pH of about 8.6, and this will prevent um, E. coli and other normal flora of the stool from overgrowing Vibrio cholerae because 
um, nor uh, enteric and other normal microbiota found in stool will not be able to grow at the pH 0.6. So somehow, it is inhibitory for the growth of, of organisms that we, you do not want to grow because here you want to isolate Vibrio. And also, this enrichment, as the term implies, enrich will allow the proliferation of Vibrio coloring. And then from there, you subculture incubated for about 6 to 8 hours at 35 to 37 degrees. And then you subculture them in selective or non-selective medium. So usually we are using PCBS. Okay, tisulfate citrate by sucrose. And incubated for 12 to, 30, 12 to 18 hours at 35 to 37 degrees centigrade. Okay, so this is the first pathway that you can probably do. And then second, so this is the ideal. And then sometimes people will not be using APW anymore, but will go directly to the PCBS and incubate 12 to 18 hours at 35 to 37 degrees. So merong disadvantage if you go this way. Disadvantage is that um, a normal fecal microbiota Katulad ng mga E. coli will overgrow vibrio cholerae. So, ito yung ano, disadvantage. If you go direct, we call it, this pathway is called direct plating. And this is the disadvantage of the direct plating. So, normal fecal microbiota will overgrow vibrio cholerae. At any rate, if you're able to get this one, so you're able to observe yellow colonies, small yellow colonies, meaning to say these bacteria are able to ferment sucrose. So you identify suspicious colonies by performing the slide agglutination test, the polyvalent O1 group antiserum, and type specific antisera. So this first test here is actually called serotyping because you want to know whether you're dealing with 0139, 01, or non 01. And then you do the string test, oxidase test, and Krigler's iron agar, Kia. So this is the biochemical test. And then you can send now the samples to reference laboratory for confirmation. So actually, marami ng confirmation. You can do PCR, 16S RNA, or you can do Malditov. So, so there are several confirmation. But usually, patients, uh, clinicians will not anymore wait for confirmation of your results. Kung nakita nila na merong diarrhea yung patient, intense yung LBM, so kagad-agad, there would be a fluid replacement therapy. Because you do not want to lose um, too much electrolytes. Ah, yun pala. This is the oxidase test. So you would notice um, yung, um, black, yung black or purplish black. So this is a positive reaction. This is the KIA. So in KIA, Vibrio is K over A because they cannot really ferment lactose. And then string test. So this is the appearance of the appearance of the string test. Okay, let's now proceed to another organism, and this time we're talking about Vibrio parahemolyticus. So Vibrio parahemolyticus is a halophilic organism that can cause gastroenteritis. Usually, you get it by eating contaminated seafood, and the incubation period is about six to nine hours. So the enterotoxin causes hypersecretion. Okay, so Vibrio will invade the epithelium and stool may be bloody as well. So the Kanagawa phenomenon is the pathogenicity test for the Vibrio parahemolyticus wherein hemolysis is a positive reaction. So it cannot ferment sucrose. Since it cannot ferment sucrose, you would expect that the colonies of Vibro parahemolyticus would be about blue-green in color. Vibrio bulnificus 
is found on the Atlantic Gulf and Pacific Coast. So they're also known as lactose-positive vibrio. So the, we can acquire them by infection from raw or undercooked seafood. And here, once infected with bulnificus, um, people would develop septicemia, particularly in people with increased serum iron road, uh, serum iron. So they are occasionally found in wounds. Vibrio alginolyticus is rarely isolated and the least pathogenic, but they are mostly found in external sites such as in ear infection, wound, or burns. Okay, so sailors or those who are in constant constant contact with seawater uh, may get infected. So particularly if you have wounds and you immerse yourselves in contaminated seawater. So to differentiate these other species of Vibrio, take note that only Vibrio alginolyticus is positive for sucrose. Therefore, it's the only one that will have yellow colonies. The rest are negative for sucrose fermentation. So you wouldn't expect them to have yellow colonies, but instead they would have a blue-green colonies on PCBS. For Vibrio parahemolyticus, um, they can cause self-limiting cholera-like diarrhea. For Vibrio bulnificus, um, they would produce um, progressive wound infection. And the same thing for alginolyticus, infection in superficial wound contaminated with seawater with, of course, the organism itself. Okay, so these are the other species of Vibrio. So to differentiate them, of course, uh, Mayhon here has actually grouped um, Vibrio into five, uh, sorry, into six. So group yourselves into six. So group one includes Vibrio cholerae and Vibrio mimicus. Group two includes Vibrio metskinovkovi. Okay, so siguro sa Russia to na discover. So that's that's why the species is metskinovkovi. Group three is Vibrio cincinnatiensis. So siguro sa Cincinnati to na discover. And group four is Oh, it's actually not Vibrio, but it's actually G. Um, Holisei, and then Vibrio damsella and Flubiasis, yung group 5. And then group 6 is Vibrio alginolyticus, parahemolyticus, bulnificus, and Harveyi. Sila naman yung group 6. Let me search first what is letter G here stands for. Uh, give me a while. Ah, yon. G. Holisei stands for, so siguro the, because of the DNA analysis, um, they assign it into a different genus. It's actually Grimontia. So, it's group four. Formerly, uh, formerly Vibrio Holisei. So now the new name is Grimontia Holisei. It was first described in 1982 and in 2003 matagal na pala no they assign a new genus for this one so hindi na vibrio ang kanyang genus ang vibrio na niya ang kanyang genus na niya ay grimontia okay so i hope you'll be able to study this table in mihon as this may be included in your examination okay so and then of course um these are the key differential biochemicals to separate within groups 1, 5, and 6. So para ma-differentiate mo daw yung group, ang cholerae and v mimicus, kasi yung the rest kasi, iisa lang yung members per group. But yung group 1, 5, and 6, maraming members. So ang vibrio cholerae from vibrio mimicus, pinaka-common is yung sucrose fermentation. Vibro damsela from Vibro fluvialis. The most common is Bodge Proskauer and um, fluvialis is positive for motility, sucrose, demanitol, and cellobios. Ito naman, yung group 6, medyo challenging because there are four members. So only alginolyticos is positive for Bodge Proskauer. Only Harvey is negative for motility. Only Alginolyticus is 
is strongly positive in sucrose. Um, Volnificus and Harvey are would have somewhat variable result for for mannitol. Only vul, Volnificus is strongly positive for cellobios, and only Volnificus is strongly positive in salicine. So this is how we differentiate them. This is how we differentiate them biochemically within the species of groups 1, 5, and 6. Okay, so other vibrionacy includes aeromonas and plesiomonas. So different genus, but the same family. So for aeromonas, we have aeromonas hydrophilia. For plesiomonas, we have plesiomonas shigeloides. So as you can see here, aeromonas hydrophila um, is an opportunistic um, pathogen and will cause fresh and brackish water infection. Plesiomonas uh, will cause um, gastroenteritis and it will cause, and it came from fresh and brackish water. So aeromonas is oxidase positive, glucose fermenters, and they are gram negative, straight, unlike curved rods of Vibrio. So they're straight rods. So they're generally found in most environments similar to Vibrios. So they can be found in cold blooded animals, such as in snake, lizard, and newts. So they can cause wound infection in fish, as you can see here. But humans can be infected as well. So in humans, um, aeromonas may cause gastroenteritis. So we can get it by having or by drinking untreated drinking water, eating contaminated seafood, and this will result into various types of diarrhea. So the diarrhea is characterized by acute secretory diarrhea with vomiting, acute dysenteric form with blood and mucus, chronic diarrhea that would last for about 10 days, cholera-like disease with rice watery stools, and the so-called traveler's diarrhea. There would, they could also cause wood infections, so various injuries while working in tainted water. So for example here, Aeromonas hydrophila, um, uh, you can get it by using of leeches during plastic surgery. Uh, it can actually it can actually be treated by use of leeches during plastic surgery to relieve congestion and swelling. Leeches, that is linta. Wow, can you imagine? Can you just imagine it? No, serious infection can actually result from wound infection. Huh? So septicemia is also possible, particularly for Aeromonas veroni, for formerly known as Aeromonas sobria. So particularly for immunocompromised patients or patients with liver disease and traumatic injury. So in McConkey agar, so in blood agar plate, they are beta hemolytic. And in McConkey, they can grow and they form pink colonies. So guys, remember, whenever we are looking at pink colonies in McConkey agar, we're looking at organisms that are able to ferment lactose. So they are lactose fermenters. So this is how we uh, classify um, different uh, species of Aeromonas. So we have here Aeromonas hydrophila, which this one is the most commonly isolated. But aside from Aeromonas hydrophila, we have the Veroni, the Biovar, Sobria, Viobar pala yung kanina, and then the Viobar Veroni, and then Eromonas Cavie, Eromonas Schuberti, Eromonas Jande, and Eromonas Trota. So, but the one that is most commonly isolated here is Eromonas Hydrophila. And then let's talk about Plesiomonas. So, Plesiomonas is another gram negative rod, and they appear singly in pairs or in short chains. They antigenically have some similar features to Shigella, but at much lower virulence. Um, They're found in tropical and subtropical waters. So Plesiomonas is oxidase positive. They are glucose fermenters, facultative anaerobic, and they are motile. So clinical infections of Plesiomonas um, shall include gastroenteritis so there were two well-known outbreaks in japan because of from eating of 
from eating of undercooked or raw seafood. Alam niyo naman, sashimi, uh, syempre, um, mga undercooked or uncooked or raw seafood yung mga yon. So, yun pala, um, uh, you'll have a higher chance or higher risk of getting plesiomonas. So, this will result to watery diarrhea, subacute or chronic disease, and it could also be dysenteric form. So, dysenteric form means that the diarrhea becomes mucoid and bloody. So, one of these is accompanied by fever and abdominal pain. So, vets and zookeepers are, at least, are actually more at risk of getting this one, extraintestinal infections. And this can also be found in cold-blooded animals such as snakes, lizards, and newts. Okay, so how do we differentiate plesiomonas? So first of all, plesiomonas is oxidase positive. So being having said that, this will actually rule out enterobacteria C because majority of enterobacteria C are oxidase negative. So they are sensitive also to very static agent, which rules out aeromonas. So aeromonas are actually resistant to bibliostatic agent. So there's no growth in high salt. So this rules out Vibrio because Vibrio cannot tolerate extremely high salt concentration. Inositol fermentation confirms plesiomonas. So inositol fermentation. So they can ferment the sugar inositol. And special media is actually being used. So we call it the IBB. So IBB here stands for inositol brilliant green bile salts. So it appears white or pink because coliforms are actually green or pink. But for if you're able to isolate aromonas, you would expect the colonies to be whitish or pinkish. Okay, so that ends our discussion with um, Bibriona C. So for now, we will now proceed to another family and we are discussing this time Spirilla C. So there are two important genera of of Vibrionaceae, okay? Ah, uh, sorry, Spirillaceae, and these are the Campylobacter and the Helicobacter. So the one that you can see here is the Wartin Staristin gastric biopsy for Helicobacter. So I'll I'll be explaining that later on. Many sub, there are many subspecies and bio varieties of Campylobacter. So we're actually talking about Campylobacter jejuni, subspecies jejuni, and Campylobacter fetus, subspecies fetus, and others. So they are microaerophilic. So when you say microaerophilic, meaning to say they would require only a small amount of oxygen for growth. So they are non spore formers, gram negative rod. So the hallmark appearance is like seagull in shape. So appears like seagull. So they're oxidase positive and catalase positive. So the motility is described as darting motility. So if you remember, Listeria is classified as tumbling motility, but this time for Campylobacter, uh, it is actually being described as darting motility. So they are non-fermentative as well. So the term Campylo means that they are curved or comma-shaped. So they're oxidase negative and catalase negative. So the Wartin star stain, the one that you that you saw a while ago, is a sensitive stain. Okay, not strain, a sensitive stain for this particular bacteria. So Cari Blair transport medium is the transport medium that we're using to transport um, organisms from a if if you isolate it from a distant location. And a special type of blood agar plate is known as the Campy Bop, otherwise known as the Blazer Medium. I say special because we have added antibiotics onto it. So we have added vancomycin, trimetoframe, and amphotericin B. So that other gram-positive bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, and even fungus will not be able to grow in Campy Bop. So this will make Campy Bop highly selective. And aside from that, we also have the Butzler and Skiro medium and medium B for the selective isolation of Campylobacter. So Campylobacter, take note, they are foodborne and can cause zoonotic infection. 
So as you can see here in the illustration, there are animals here. Kasi nga, they are zoonotic infections. So the two most common species associated with human infections are Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli. Campylobacter species are found in the enterics of a wide variety of animals, including chicken, um, cow, um, cats, and even dogs. Transmission to human is primarily by oral and fecal contamination. So Campylobacter is a small, comma-shaped bacteria. So the term Campylo in Greek means curve. So they are motile and require microaerophilic atmosphere for growth. So Campylobacter jejuni grows best at 42 degrees centigrade. So these bacilli have typical gram-negative structure with many different O antigen and H antigen. So again, O means that it came from cell wall, while H means that it came from the flagellar. Okay? So, Campylobacter jejuni, we're in Campylobacter coli, Campylobacter lari are similar. So, this the one is the most common diarrheal illness worldwide. Ah, ito pala yung pinaka-common cause of diarrhea. So, the diarrhea is characterized by mild or is, is actually accompanied with mild abdominal pain. And it is characterized by cramps and bloody diarrhea and may follow with fever, chills, and rarely nausea and vomiting. So, fortunately, the diarrhea caused by Campylobacter jejuni is self-limiting that would last for about two to six days. But then again, you have to be conscious of the dehydration status. So, However, some patients may remain carriers for several months. So, Campylobacter fetus is most frequently isolated from blood cultures, particularly from blood cultures of immunocompromised and elderly patients. So, they are known. The reason why we call them fetus as species because they are known to cause abortion in cattle, sheep, and pigs, but not in humans. Okay? In humans... Um, uh, they, did, they do not cause abortion in humans, but only abortions in animals. Okay? So, ingested bacteria will reach the ileum near the colon, and it, they will adhere and varrow deep into the mucosa. So, within a week, because they have burrowed deep into the mucosa, watery or bloody diarrhea is produced. Okay? Although a variety of, toxins, of toxins have been isolated, the precise nature of pathogenesis is not understood. So the severity of the disease depends on the following. So bacterial load on ingestion, lack of gastric acids, debilitation, and immune status. status. Okay? So bacterial load, pag mas madami kang nainom or nakain na bacteria, you have more CFU per ml. This is a colony forming unit per ml, meaning to say must concentrated yung bacteria, then the disease becomes more severe. If you do not have gastric acid, because gastric acid will also help us in killing the bacteria, then the infection becomes more severe. And of course, your immune system. Okay? In healthy hosts, the diarrhea is usually self-limiting. So, yung may mga comorbidity, katulad ng mga diabetic, patient with AIDS, cancer patients, so the diarrhea could be severe for them as well. Okay, so that is for Campylobacter. Now, let's talk about Helicobacter. Okay, so these bacteria have only been, have only recently been isolated, so 1982 lang. The most popular species is Helicobacter pylori. However, aside from pylori, we have other species, and this include Cinedi and Fenillae. So humans are probably the main host, but transmission routes have not yet been established. Okay, so they are found in the mucus gel that coats the stomach epithelium. Meaning to say, this particular type of bacteria can survive our gastric juice. Can you imagine a while ago, I, I was actually mentioning that uh, if you lack gastric juice, then the chances of you getting a severe infection with Campylobacter would be greater. 
But here, it's the other way around because Helicobacter loves gastric juice. And it's kind of bizarre because gastric juice is supposed to help us fighting infection. But for Helicobacter, they're able to survive in the presence of the gastric juice. So what do you think is the reason why? So later on, I'll tell you. So uh, uh, here pala, um, oops, sorry. Medyo nauna yung slide ko ng helicobacter, but kaya na preempt. Sorry, sorry for that, but Naiwan yung slide na ito. Ayan. So, these are some of the members of Campylobacter. Ayan. So, ang nabanggit lang natin is Jejuni, Jejuni, Coli, and Larry, and then Fetus, and then yung Helicobacter pylori. So I'll just, and then these are the different species of Campylobacter and the different, and then the different type of diseases. So I hope you can study this in table 26 of your Mahon book. And I forgot to mention here, actually, uh, nabanggit ko na to nung introduction, the composition of the Campybop the Skiro, the Butzler, and the CCDA. So and what are these? These are the selective medium, selective media for the cultivation of Campylobacter. Okay, so ito lang yung nalimutan ko sa Campylobacter. Pero pinaka-tinatanong lagi sa board exam is yung composition ng Campybop. Vancomycin, trimetrophrine, polymyxin B, amphotericin B, and cephal cephalotin. Okay, so let's go back to discussion of Helicobacter. Ah, ito pala, I forget also. Um, Campylobacter jejuni um, grows best at 42 degrees. Unlike Campylobacter fetus. However, Campylobacter jejuni cannot grow at 4, 25 degrees centigrade. Both of them can grow at 37 degrees. Um, Campylobacter jejuni is positive with hyperate hydrolysis and there are susceptible to nalidixic acid but resistant to cephalotin, which is kabaligtaran naman ni Campylobacter fetus. Okay, so nasira yung discussion natin on, on Helicobacter. So again, let me review to you. Helicobacter pylori loves gastric juice. So they are found in the mucus gel that coats the stomach epithelium. So Helicobacter pylori colonizes 20 to 40 percent of adults. That's the data found in the United States. We do not have data yet in the Philippines. So it's a majority cause of chronic superficial gastritis. And it's also possible that person-to-person -person transfer uh, could happen. So Helicobacter pylori does not invade the tissue, but they does but does live in the mucus covering the surface of the stomach. Ito yung sinasabi ko kanina na mucus gel. And the reason why they are able to survive with the corrosiveness of the gastric juice is because of the enzyme urease. So urease will break down urea to ammonia and will neutralize the stomach pH. So not all bacteria can produce urease. Okay? So helicobacter can produce urease and that's somehow... Um, neutralize the stomach pH. So, therefore, um, our body would produce, uh, would react by having a low-grade inflammatory response and, and because of the presence of Helicobacter pylori, this will result into ulcer. There would be ulceration in the stomach and that ulceration in the stomach is known as the type B gastritis. And type B gastritis, if not addressed immediately, can result to gastric carcinoma, gastric carcinoma or stomach cancer. So how do we identify helicobacter? 
So one way of identifying them is by cultivating them in Christian sense urea medium. So since they're able to produce urease, you would expect that there would be rapid color change in two hours. And then, of course, we can collect specimen, but it's kind of difficult because you need a biopsy specimen from the stomach. Okay? And then do the gymsar gram or silver stain. Perhaps one of the most popular tests for Helicobacter pylori is the urea breath test because this one is non-invasive and it wouldn't require you to have gastric biopsy. So all you have to do is to drink uh, uh, radioactive C-labeled urea. And then, so meron kang radioactive urea, then if you'll be drinking it, um, if you have if you have um, Helicobacter pylori in your stomach, the radioactive or the C-labeled urea will be degraded by urease and you will be producing carbon dioxide. And then you have to you have to breathe in a scintillation counter to detect if you're able to release a radioactive CO2. Yeah, so yon. That is the urea breath test. Okay, so somehow it is non-invasive for, for the diagnosis of Helicobacter pylori. But then again, you can also you can also use culture media. Um, by the way, we can use the same culture media for Campylobacter and Helicobacter. No, so we can use um Campibap, um Brucella agar, and then Sciro media. Butzler media and it can grow the plate in micro aerophilic, capnophilic atmosphere. So again, the by the way, the Butzler media is the improved version of the V media. So again, let me show you again the composition of the different culture media that we can probably use that can possibly use for Campylobacter and Helicobacter. So Campybap has vancomycin which will prevent prevent gram positive bacteria from growing trimetoprim will prevent um, gram negative bacteria from growing the same thing with polymyxin b avotericin b will prevent fungi from growing so so yun yung mga ano so ano yung purpose ng mga antimicrobial agents that we're adding here um, this serves as inhibitory substances and take note also if the culture media has inhibitory substances this will make the culture media highly selective okay hence selective media yung tinatawag without inhibitory substances then the culture medium will never become selective and again these are the biochemical tests that will allow us to differentiate different species of Campylobacter, Arcobacter, and Helicobacter. So again, so just to reiterate to everyone that um, the specimen found in helico, in, in human gastric tissue, not genetic, no, human gastric tissue, they can cause the type B gastritis and specimen is gastric biopsy material. So I did mention that already. So my helicobacter is microaerophilic and they're highly motile and they produce a large amount of urease. Uh, I have already mentioned that. So this is a wartin starry medium, a stain. So wartin starry stain, once you have done the gastric biopsy for helicobacter, then you can stain it with wartin starry. Okay, so you would notice here that the organisms would be adherent, okay, at the gel. At the surface of the epithelial cells but they will not invade the epithelial cells but they will simply adhere there so because of the adherence factors motility and mucinase mucinase can actually lyse the gel clot so that's the function of the enzyme helicobacter flagella are very powerful and allow movement through the viscous stomach lining of gel Okay, so Helicobacter pylori is associated with gastritis, gastric, and duodenal ulcer. And they can be found in human stomach, normally considered to be hostile environment for microbes, but not for Helicobacter. 
Okay, so that ends our discussion with Helicobac spirilacy and we're done also with uh, Vibrionacy.